Hello, everyone. I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Thank you for braving the terrible rain and coming to this week's History's Lunch Program. We're in our home, the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium in the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum, and we're streaming live on both Facebook and YouTube, where those videos are available to watch any times afterward. And if you've not already done so, please silence your cell phone. There are several events coming up you should know about. On Friday, February 2nd at 10 a.m., the Mississippi National Guard has organized a program in this space commemorating four Mississippi chaplains who died during World War II. The men, a rabbi, a Catholic priest, a Methodist, and a Dutch Reformed minister gave up their life vests to soldiers on the SS Dorchester as it sunk. A reception will follow the ceremony, which is free and open to the public. So I hope we'll see you on February 2nd. Then on Saturday, February 3rd, we'll have an African-American genealogy workshop next door in the Winter Building, led by our friend and longtime MDAH archivist, Joyce Dixon Lawson. You can register for that free program on the MDAH website. February 13th is the date for the 2024 Evers Lecture, and we'll have Joanne Reed discussing her new book, Medgar and Murley, Medgar Evers and the Love Story That Awakened America. Finally, I hope that you'll come back next week for History's Lunch when Wesley Shoup will join us to discuss his new book, Mississippi's Natural Heritage. Today, I am delighted to welcome back our friends John Ramsey Miller and Stephen Smith, who were here several years ago when John's book, McCarty's of Marigold, Mississippi, The Pottery, was published. This time, they're here supporting a new book that focuses on the jewelry made by Lee and Pup McCarty throughout the years. John Ramsey Miller was born in Greenville and educated at Delta State University and Southern Illinois University at Carbondale. His book, McCarty's of Marigold, Mississippi, The Jewelry, 1948 to 2015, was published late last year. A former photojournalist and screenwriter, Miller is a New York Times bestselling author of seven suspense novels and a nonfiction book. Stephen Smith grew up in Marigold. He earned his BA in German literature from Davidson College and then studied law at the University of Georgia. Smith is a member of the Board of Directors of the USA International Ballet Competition in Jackson and a member of the University of Georgia Library's Board of Visitors. Stephen and his brother Jamie were the McCarty's godsons and now operate the pottery. So we'll hear first from Stephen, um, then we will watch a short documentary on McCarty's and then John will come up and talk to us about the new book and the jewelry. There will be um, some of the jewelry on display that you can take a look at afterwards, and we have copies of the books as well. For now, help me welcome Stephen Smith to the stage. Great. Thank you so much, Chris, for that kind introduction. I'll, make, I'll add one other little quick thing. Uh, John and I are very pleased that today's sales of the books will be donated to the museum. So please support the museum. And again, thank you all for coming out. A special thanks also to Chris's staff for putting this together. It's a great series. We certainly enjoy being here last time, and we're delighted to be back again today. Also, a special thanks out to uh, Desiree Frazier, with Mississippi Public Broadcasting. They were very kind to promote the event today on Mississippi Edition, and we appreciate the support from Mississippi Public Broadcasting. As Chris mentioned, I'm one of the godchildren of Lee and Pup McCarty, and today you'll hear me refer to them as Uncle Lee and Aunt Pup, or Unc and Aunt Pup. Now, of course, these are terms of endearment. My brother and I are the godchildren. We're not really blood-related to Uncle Lee and Aunt Pup, but uh, we are, as Uncle Lee would say, related by love. So like so many small towns, friends of family become family over time. You may have had a similar experience. You're 12, 13 years of age. And you ask your mom, how are we related to Aunt Sue? And she says, well, we're not related at all. And you think, wait, wait, wait a minute. She's been at every birthday. She comes to Christmas. You mean we're not blood related? And she says, no, we're just good friends. And that's the same way with us. So uh, Uncle Lee's mother and my great aunt Margaret were best of friends. And then when Uncle Lee's father left in the depression, then uh, Uncle Lee, excuse me, then Uncle Albert became a father figure to Uncle Lee and helped raise him. Now Uncle Albert and Aunt Margaret didn't have children, so Uncle Lee was sort of like their child. And then when Uncle Lee and Aunt Pup didn't have children, they got me and my brother. So. 
And uh, so it was a great, we were very fortunate. We were very fortunate. Uncle Lane and Pup were a second set of parents to me and my brother, as they were to John as well. And we were all very blessed to have had them in our lives and give us that wonderful direction and input that they had. Now, my brother uh, started out with pottery as a child and worked really kind of as a hobby with Uncle Ian and Pop, and then over the years continued. And then in January of 1998, Uncle Ian and Pop uh, asked Jamie to come back to the business and see if it was something that he would want to do. And of course, he leapt at the opportunity. It's a great opportunity. And of course, he returned home as a potter to join the business. And it didn't take him long to realize that they needed someone to run the business side of things in order for my brother and Uncle and Aunt Pup to focus on the artistic side and the creative side of the business. And at the time, I was practicing law in Georgia, so I returned home in June of 1998 to handle the business affairs in the restaurant, and then that allowed my brother and Uncle and Aunt Pup to focus on just the artistic side of the business and the creative side of things. And my brother and I were very lucky. We... Uh, Aunt, we had Aunt Pup until 2009, and then Uncle Lee until 2015. So my brother was able to work closely with Aunt Pup until, well, for 11 years, and for Uncle Lee, uh, with Uncle Lee for 17 years. So we were very fortunate in that regard. And, of course, we are very proud to continue the McCarty's tradition in Marigold at the studio and very proud to say that we are celebrating 70 years of business as of this August. So something that we're all very proud of and uh, indeed something to, to celebrate, especially in a small town like Marigold, all 527 of us. It's amazing that any business can stay in business in such a small town for so long, and we're pleased to be there, obviously. Now, Uncle Lee was from Marigold. Aunt Pup was from outside of Ethel and the Hills. They met at Delta State University. Uncle Lee went off to World War II, returned. By that time, Aunt Pup had already graduated from Delta State. And uh, then Uncle Lee went to Ole Miss on the GI Bill, where he majored in education. From there, they went to Columbia University in New York, where Uncle Lee received his master's in education. And it was in New York and at Columbia that they took a class in jewelry making. And John will elaborate on this much in much greater detail a bit later. But that's where they really first started in terms of creative uh, and artistic type things with jewelry making at Columbia. Then they returned to Oxford, where Uncle Lee taught in the demonstration school. He taught chemistry. And it was there in Oxford that they really came into pottery. Now, of course, you've got to keep in mind, at this time, in the late 1940s, Oxford very small, the university very small. And Pop wanted to audit one of the pottery classes, and she knew Chancellor Williams, J.D. Williams. So she asked J.D. if she could audit the class. And, of course, he said, well, that's fine, Pop. Just go down there and tell the professor that J.D. said it was okay. So no trip to the registrar's office. She just goes early. Tells the professor, and of course he says, that's fine. Just wait for the class to arrive, and then we'll get started. Well, pretty soon a big fellow walked in, then another big fellow, then a whole bunch of big fellows. And Aunt Pup realized that she was taking pottery with the Ole Miss football team. <laughs> she was the only female in the class, so she went home that night, and she said, Lee, guess what? And he said, what? And she said, you are going to take pottery. And he did. And that's where they discovered their love and passion for pottery. And that's where it really all began. And I used to joke with Uncle Lee, and I told him that thanks to Chancellor J.D. Williams and Ole Miss football, McCarty's came into existence. And they started there in Oxford. They had a little house at 210 South Lamar Street. They had a little garage. They had Uncle Lee's kick wheel in there, a little kiln. But then, of course, the question came, well, what to do for clay? Well, Uncle Lee offhandedly mentioned this in class one day. They needed clay, and a young lady raised her hand. He said, yes. And she said, well, Mr. Lee, if you need clay, why don't you call Dad, and I'm sure you can come over to the house and get all the clay you want. Well, the child was Jill Faulkner, and, of course, Dad, William Faulkner, and the house, Roanoke. Again, Oxford being very small at the time, Uncle Lee knew Mr. Bill, as he called him. So he called Faulkner, and, of course, Faulkner said, Lee, come to the house. There's shovels in the barn, and you can dig all the clay you want. Now, if you, when you're back at Roanoke, if you uh, look behind the home, there's a barn. To the left is a large stand of trees. Now, in the 1940s, those trees weren't there. And behind the trees is a ravine. 
And Uncle Lee would go there and periodically dig clay. And that's what they used for their very first pieces. So it's a great connection that they had. And then one other great connection, too, is that toward the end of Uncle Lee's career, in the summer of 2015, the Chancellor's Office notified us that Uncle Lee would be inducted into the Ole Miss Alumni Hall of Fame, which is a great honor and also a nice bookend to their career because they started in Oxford at the university and then to have that recognition at the very end, again, was a lovely tribute to have. Now, when you think about McCarty's, if you were to think of it in terms of, say, a recipe, and you think, well, what are the ingredients to McCarty's? What makes it? Well, obviously, Lee and Pump McCarty as artists. But the trick is that they have to be together. Now, no doubt, Uncle Lee and Aunt Pump could have been wonderful artists on their own if they had never met, but they would not have created McCarty's independently of each other. So you had to have first that wonderful artistic chemistry between the two of them, but then also more than that was their love for one another. They were married 61 years, and that love comes through in the joy of their work, their creations, in their jewelry, in their pottery, and you can see that. Now, the third element would be the connection with the state of Mississippi, the Mississippi Delta, and Marigold. Now, that's important because if they were somewhere else, and let's say they had decided early on to move to California or New York. No doubt they would have had a wonderful artistic enterprise together, but it would not have been McCarty's. McCarty's had to be in the state of Mississippi. It had to be home. And their work reflects that. Of course, Uncle Lee developed the glazes along with Aunt Pup because of his chemistry background. And you can see that tribute to the Mississippi Delta in the nutmeg glaze, which that is that wonderful brown glaze. And it represents, if you will, the rich alluvian soil of the Mississippi Delta. Then also the little black squiggly mark, which is our registered trademark, represents the Mississippi River. The little ridges on the pieces represent the rows of cotton in the Mississippi Delta. So you have those connections right there. Then when you think about all right, how the business developed, well, Uncle Ian and Aunt Pup returned home in 1953 after being in Oxford. Uncle Lee was teaching high school in Shelby. He was teaching high school chemistry. And then it was Aunt Pup's idea to actually open a business. She was the one who decided that they should make a go of it in terms of pottery. Now, of course, neither one had money at that time. What to do? Fortunately, uh, Uncle Albert had mechanized the farm to the point that we no longer needed mule teams in town, so the mule barn was empty. They took that mule barn, turned it into their studio, uh, reorganized it, and then they took the gardens, developed those into beautiful gardens, which we were very appreciative of the Greenville Garden Club in 2011, coming, documenting all the plants, submitting the paperwork to the Smithsonian Institution, and in 2012, we were inducted into the Smithsonian's Archives of American Gardens. So not bad for a town of 527 people. You know, we're very pleased to have had that. And it's a great, great example of what they set. And as you can imagine, I talked to a number of high school groups and college groups. And the one thing I remind all of the young people is, first, Uncle Ian and Aunt Pup were able to pursue their dreams right here in the state of Mississippi. They did not have to leave. There is opportunity in our state. You can pursue your dreams right here at home. The next thing is that they took nothing and created something. They took a dilapidated mule barn, created a beautiful art gallery, if you will, and studio for their work. They took dilapidated, a dilapidated mule pasture and turned it into beautiful gardens that are part of the Smithsonian. They took nothing and created something. So these things are possible, and they're a great inspiration in that regard. The other thing is what makes McCarty's unique. Now, long ago, there was a reporter who asked Uncle Lee that very question. Now, the reporter was not from our state. So he anticipated, no doubt, an artistic answer. I'm sure he thought Uncle Lee would say something along the lines of, well, the glazes are our own formula, so that distinguishes us from other potters. Or perhaps he would say, the little squiggly mark is the Mississippi River, our trademark. And that distinguishes us from other potters and makes us unique. 
But that's not the answer Uncle Lee gave. He gave an answer that's typically Mississippian. He said, what makes McCarty's unique is that it reminds people of home, a sense of place. And I've always loved that phrase, a sense of place. And when you think about it, our history here in the state of Mississippi is our sense of place. And how fitting that we are here today at the two museums. Our sense of place, our history. And here at the museums, we are at home. Thank you all so much for having me. And with that, we're going to watch this wonderful documentary that Rex Jones at Ole Miss did on Uncle Lee and the studio. Thank you all again. But the connectedness, the, the, the synapticness of everything, that once you become interested in people and genuinely interested, not surface interested or for a reason, uh, you'll find that life is kind of nice. I'm Lee McCarty, and I'm part of Lee and Pup McCarty, the, the ceramic and designer team and the gardeners of Marigold, Mississippi. We wanted to come home. I'd been in World War II five and a half years, teaching at Ole Miss five years. I never did want to go all like so many people who had gotten well-educated, and they said, uh, you've got to have money to start a business. And I said, well, we didn't have, we don't have any money because I was teaching school. We had to say, what, oh, like three or four or $500 is all we'd saved. But what we had was the love for the state of Mississippi and that we knew we could do it. I was teaching in the high school, which was a part of the University of Mississippi at that time. So I was really teaching for Ole Miss because I was teaching high school. There's been some misconception of that. I was not in that league of being able to teach on the university level. <laughs> but I was teaching children, young people, and I, I taught five years and I loved it. I loved every minute of it and also the chancellor said, yeah, Lee and Pup, they could they can make it. And Dick Keep, my boss, said, yeah, they can make it. So they just almost thumbed their nose at the rest of the faculty members that were interested in us, saying, that's, that's what the books say. And they, they're out, they'll, pro they'll probably prove the books wrong, and guess what? We have. Quality in living, whether you live in a barn, the way you live in a barn matters. That reflects in the way you do business, and that reflected in the way we presented our pottery. We wanted our pieces of pottery to be used and to not be museum pieces necessarily, though they are. And we've tried so much to use Mississippi, the Mississippi River, the shape of the Mississippi Delta. That's where I live. And growing up here in this small community, there was always a, a relationship, an interrelationness, a, a synaptic connection to so many, many uh, occurrences or events that were important to me as a child. I placed importance on a small thing. And I spent hours of my life lying on my back and playing with clouds, watching the sky change. 
One of the most beautiful things about Mississippi, other than the people and the beautiful women, is the sunset. changes of the colors and so forth, which are so evident and your the variations in the it's not solid blue. There's a slight difference because it's done by hand. The taller pieces that we try to get has what? Well it's the height of the sky. It's not the fact that it's a tall piece. It's just a tall piece. It also reflects the lift in the Mississippi Delta. And when you come out of those hills and come down in the Delta, you feel a lift to it. And my wife really felt that way. And I do too. So therefore, it, it becomes a part of you. The creative process is hard to explain. It's, there's some things you don't just teach. You have to observe, and it just evolves. There could not be a possible interview concerning McCarty's that you would not consider that Pup McCarty, Pup Rome McCarty, was the pivot point for the success of our business. Pup had always been involved with artists. So she was from that league of, of people thinking and searching and searching for the answer, which we all are. I want to be sure that you understand. <laughs> I want you to be sure that you all understand that when, that when you marry, your wife becomes a very integral part of your life. And I'm very fortunate. And, the, and also the, Mar the, the pottery of Marigold, Mississippi is very fortunate to have had Pope McCarty. On the shell, which I'm a Pisces, you know, the Lord made the ones that, that are on the, by the swimming pool, and they're from Tahiti. And they have enormous, deep scallops, and they fit together, which the scallops work. But if you want to take it and use it to hold chicken salad, you can't, you run out of space because the scallops run up high. So what we Pope and I did, <laughs> we took the large shell and raised the scallops. It took a long time to get that worked out, see how the scallops rise, and then hold water, and you could you could serve punch out of it. It's for a small group, or or um, it's a, an alteration of. The real thing. That's the real thing. This is McCarty. There you are, back again to the connection. Everything is wonderfully connected. So wonderfully connected and interconnected. Whatever you do.
I used to walk faster. Uh, look at that little piece of paper there. <laughs> Sorry. I don't want to forget anything. So I wrote down about four things. I used to stand uh, without falling, too. <laughs> the first time I went to uh, the studio, it was uh, summer of 1966. And uh, I walked in with a, a female friend of mine that I'd made at high school. And uh, Pup came out. And she was just the dearest little thing. She was about that tall and just vivacious and wonderful. And um, I talked to her for about 20 minutes. And Lee came. I think Lee was taking a nap, if I remember correctly. He came downstairs and um, brought coffee downstairs. And I sat and had coffee with him. And uh, that started a close friendship. Uh, anyway, I, I did notice when I walked into the studio, uh, in those days, there weren't a lot of people walking into the studio, but uh, I remember there was a burlap square, I think it's still there, it may still be there, and there, were, there was jewelry on, on it, and uh, I asked her about the jewelry, and she said, well, we make the jewelry, and they had a, a dental cabinet, I guess for equipment, dental equipment, you can see glass on four sides and, and the glass, and they had the good jewelry in there, the gold. He always, was always making jewelry next to, the, to his potter's wheel, and later next to Jamie, when Jamie was throwing, uh, Lee would do so much pottery and then he so, so much jewelry. And a lot of people don't know about the jewelry because I don't know why they don't know about the jewelry. It always impressed me, but... Uh, the, the missing cross came back in 1999 in an envelope and with two pocket knives that were handmade pocket knives. And the man said, this is a cross I took from the studio in 1973 or 74 or 71, whenever it was. And he said, I, I did two tours in Vietnam and I think this cross helped get me through it. So... Pup and Lee sent the cross back to him and said, all is forgiven. Enjoy. So they got it back, and then they gave it back again. So that's just the kind of people they were. Um, I've got a wedding ring, this wedding ring, that Lee, Lee made for me for my first wedding. Um, I had two, and um, I, I still wear it. Uh, to this day, not as a wedding ring, but on a small finger. Um, when, when they made jewelry, uh, Lee always had three rings. He'd have one ring and two rings, and that was a trilogy. God the Father, you know, that religious trilogy. And he did that with every piece he had th rings on. There were th always three. Um, anyway, let me tell you about the book. This is a book. And in about 1970, 1972, I gave Pup a book of, called Flowers by Irving Penn. And she said it was the most beautiful book she'd ever seen because every flower seemed to be alive and was isolated. So I, when I thought about doing the book, when we talked about doing the book, Stephen and Jamie and I, I said, you know, I want to do a book that's reminiscent of that. I want the jewelry to be just the jewelry, and I photographed, photographed it, uh, worked on the book about eight months, and I did, I did um, studio photography, and, and uh, I call it close hand photography, it, it, uh, advertising photography, and um, anyway, you'll see that, you can see here that e every page has one piece on it, or maybe a few pieces at work as a, as a combination. But we wanted the book to be special, and I think it is. Um, I know it's special to me, and uh, their jewelry meant a lot to me. And I used to love to watch Lee making it. He would make tiny, delicate pieces, or he would make big, massive copper rings, uh, bracelets. So... 
I'm, uh, I'm glad I got to do the book. We had it printed in the United States. Uh, that was one thing we did with both books. We didn't let them go overseas. We kept them at home. And uh, I went and sat uh, for a week with the printers. And I would, they would call me when they had sheets coming off the press, and I would go look at them. Um, but that was my involvement in that. We had it um, stitch bound instead of uh, glue bound. We just wanted it to be a tribute to, to Pup and Lee. And I think that's what it is. And um, I don't know, there's not a lot of else to say about it. I mean, I could talk about them all day long, uh, how impressive they were. And I, I know a lot of you here knew them. Um, they were just amazing, amazing people. And I was lucky enough to have two sets of great parents. And that's what, they, that's what it felt like, the relationship felt like. Um, I'm going to stop here and open, open for questions. And Steve will come back up. Thank you. For that very impressive presentation. Photography, jewelry, and your capacity to produce such beautiful work. Um, my question is um, operating in the Delta with a limited population at a time of segregation. Um, how did that affect your small community where you, with such a limited, um, you talk about 500 or 1,000 people that make up the community. And um, <clears throat> there's a, that means that there's a very small, limited market. And, um, at the time of segregation, and black people are living there plentifully, and there's segregation, so that makes your market very limited in terms of uh, being able to um, have an extension, extended um, market to really make big profits. How, how are you able to cope with such a small market uh, with limited population and segregation in a place where you have a lot of black people to deal with? Wonderful. Thank you so much for the question. And it does go back to the history of the Mississippi Delta. Now, of course, Uncle Andy and Pump, when they opened the business in 1954, their door was open to everyone. So that was never an issue when it came to the studio and Uncle Andy and Pump. Now, in terms of sales and starting out, Uncle Andy and Pump didn't have customers when they first started. They were uh, very unknown, if you will. Now, Part of that also was by design. So for example, they approached the business from an artistic view. They didn't engage in business as such, which is odd when you think about it. For example, Uncle Amy and Pump never had a sign telling customers, this is McCarty's. There was no sign at all. They didn't believe in signs. And Uncle Amy and Pump's view was that if you create something of quality, people will find you. And that was the way they started. Now, of course, that meant early on, you didn't have much in the way of customers, and they didn't. They struggled. Matter of fact, as I mentioned earlier, I do a lot of talks for uh, high school students, college students, etc., And I'll tell them that the pursuit of your dreams can often involve initially a struggle and success will come later through your hard work and perseverance. And that was certainly true with Uncle Ian and Pop. The business really didn't catch on, if you will, through word of mouth until the late 1970s. And that's when success really found them as such. But of course, in the world of artists, it's unusual for any artist to achieve financial success during the course of their lifetime. After all, Van Gogh never sold a single painting. So for Uncle Andy and Pump to achieve success is truly amazing in and of itself. I'll tell you another story, if you will, in terms of the way they viewed life and their business. 
on Saturdays, my brother and I would go over to the studio and Uncle and Pop had a swimming pool and we would swim, we would have ice cream, we'd have a little tea party as such and enjoy a Saturday afternoon. Uncle and Pop had a hard and fast rule, which was if they had a customer, we had to get out of the pool while they tended to business. I never remember getting out of the pool on a Saturday. <laughs> now, I look back on that now as the person in charge of running the business affairs and anyone in the retail world will tell you, Saturday is your day in the retail world. You can be slow on a Monday, you can be slow on a Tuesday, but if you're slow on a Saturday, you have problems. I look back on it now and I'm horrified to think that we would go three, four hours with nobody coming in. But here's the thing that's beautiful about Uncle Ain't Aunt Paul, and it's that artistic mentality. As we all know, children are very perceptive. They can tell when a grown-up is upset or when you're ill at ease. They can sense that. I never felt that around Uncle Ain't Aunt Pop as a child. When we were enjoying our Saturday afternoons with my brother, we were having a great time. They were at ease. They were happy. And that's the beauty of the artistic mentality. Even though they weren't making money, it didn't matter to them. They were living in that moment. That moment was happiness, and they loved it. And that's truly a tribute to them. And I'll look back on that as one of my great memories of childhood, even though at the time I didn't appreciate it. But as an adult now, I really admire that attribute, that they had the ability to live life on their own terms and that they could enjoy that moment. And that's a great blessing. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Any other questions? I'm pretty sure I read not long ago about a, an African-American, I believe it's pottery, uh, business operation studio, whatever, in Marigold now. And I wonder whether that was in any way an outgrowth of the McCarty's. Gotcha, okay, I'll take that one as well. There, there's not one in Marigold, but there is one in Mount Bow, which is a wonderful, historically, all African-American community located two miles from Marigold. And that particular studio has had great success over the years. Absolutely, but thank you for asking, thank you. Let me ask a question from the live stream. Um, the, is, what materials did the McCarty's use um, in their jewelry making? Ah. I can take that one. Everything. <laughs> uh, that, that they used, uh, for metals, they used copper and silver. Um, you know, Lee would, was not against melting down silver, sterling silver spoons and turning them into something else. Uh, in fact, there's a pair of earrings in here that's spoon, but you can't tell it's a spoon unless you know it's a spoon. Um, they used woods. They used... Um, uh, Pup's favorite was copper. She loved working in copper. Um, I always tell people, I can't tell who did which piece of jewelry because I only know the ones I saw being made. And I was never in Pup's presence when she was making anything. I, I was never in her studio. So I don't know, but they used, uh, he used ebony wood from Africa. He used um, piano keys. Uh, he, he used everything. I mean, he, it was amazing what he would see and things he looked at that he would bring out. There's a concho belt in here that's made out of copper and river stones. And it's kind of their tribute to the, um, to the concho belt. So, yeah, they used, he used everything and anything. And there's some great pictures in the book of the two of them and Lee is wearing Yes. As well. So they made for both. They absolutely did. I mean, the, most of their jewelry was probably unisex jewelry because you, know, you could wear it or I could wear it or she could wear it. And uh, Pup got away with wearing, you know, she, like I said, she was tiny uh, but fierce. She was tiny. And uh, she would wear earrings that were, you know, this big. So... 
I mean, she, they believed anybody could wear anything, and and uh, it was a style. Their their jewelry, they wore their jewelry, and they gave away a lot of their jewelry, and they sold a lot of their jewelry. But I think the jewelry, I think the jewelry was more of a way to relax uh, for Lee um, than than throwing pots. I think he, I think he was really into it. In fact, I would, you know, recently. Before he died, I would see Jamie at the wheel, and Lee would be at the jewelry bench working on jewelry. And his last years, he he worked on a lot of jewelry and made a lot of jewelry. And you go around Cleveland, Mississippi, you'll see his bracelets on people everywhere. Um, he was very he was a very generous man and a, and an extremely talented man. But all McCarty jewelry. That has ever that's ever going to exist has been made. Yes. Yes. All the jewelry. Uh, when Lee passed away in 2015, uh, the jewelry went into um, storage. Um, it's it's um, you have to get it at estate sales or from collectors. It's there's um, there's a lot of it, but very little comes onto the market. And with one caveat, we are going to. Continue doing some of the ceramic pieces. Right. Jewelry. I'm sorry. But as far as all the metal working, that is that is past, so to speak. Other questions? Starving artists. How did they survive? <laughs> <laughs> they were very thin. Well. It, it's amazing what that generation could do coming through the Depression and World War II. And it's a great question, especially for the young people today. I think for that generation going through it, it didn't cross their mind to do anything but that. It wasn't so much a matter of survival as it was simply living. And I think we look back on it now from the modern day perspective where our crisis is that our iPhone runs out of battery juice, you know. And that generation, they, they dealt with not having food. And, but, but again, it's one of those things of perseverance, perseverance. And you simply dealt with it and moved forward and kept pursuing that dream. And that ties into a great question that I had for them. When they remodeled the barn, they moved upstairs into the hayloft. They had Uncle Lee's kick wheel down low. They had two kilns under the stairs that fired to 2,000 degrees. They had no air conditioning upstairs. So imagine in the middle of July in the Mississippi Delta, you have 4,000 degrees of temperature below you. You have the hot July air of the Mississippi Delta. And I asked him, well, how in the world did y'all live? And she said, well, Stephen, we would open the French doors because there's a screen in front of the French doors that were in the hayloft. They'd open those up, you had the screen. They would drag their mattress in front of the screen and turn on a fan, and they just survived. Now, to me, I think, my goodness, how in the world did y'all do that? But from their mentality, that mentality of the, the greatest generation, they simply persevered, and they were just hot, but they dealt with it. Now, I, I look at it from this day and age, and I think, how in the world did they do that? Now, of course, you know, out of fairness, as the business did become more successful, we did air condition the upstairs, you know, amenities followed. But nevertheless, but it's a, it's a great question. And, and again, one of perseverance in the pursuit of one's dreams. We have another question from the live stream. Did the McCartys maintain any friendships with other Mississippi artists of their era? Mm. Oh, yes. absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely. They knew practically everyone. You know, and it's interesting uh, they're uh, good friends with the Andersons and, of course, Shearwater Pottery on the coast. They knew them well and it's around, uh, many others as well. And, uh, of course, one of the things that always amazed me as a child was that Uncle Indian Pup were in my fifth grade history book on Mississippi history. <laughs> they were always amazed by that. But, yes, they were, they were friends with a number of different folks. And then, of course, knew Faulkner in Oxford as well and that kind of thing. Sure, absolutely. And Theodore Hamlet. They promoted Theodore Hamlet and um, Mary Hull. Um, a lot, a lot of painters, um, and other other potters. Yeah, they they were they were um, they were friends with everybody, but yeah, they knew a lot of artistic people. 
and good friends with Mary Sims from Memphis That's as right. well, and a number of other folks. Malcolm Norwood, who's the director of the Delft State uh, University Art Department for a number of years, very active in, in the art community as well. I know they were friends with at least one writer, Will D. Campbell, because I went to uh -huh. Marigold with him to pick out a present for his wife, Brenda. Uh -huh. And he was embraced, and of course he's a civil rights activist, yes. so they had to be good people or he wouldn't have been there. But uh, he picked out a rather large rabbit for Brenda. Mm -hmm. who, when we got back to the holler, to Mount Juliet, uh, she said she thought she might use it as a doorstop. <laughs> hey, you'll know, you'll know what this is. That's a cross that they made for Will Campbell, and he, met, he, he got these from them and gave them to... Close associates. He did. You know, I know several people who got one. I did not, but I know other people who did. Well, if I had one, I'd give it to you. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Other questions? So, we actually have a treat today. We've got some of the jewelry here. Can you say a few words about that? Well, yeah, in just a few moments, I'll put some of the pieces out for y'all to come by and take a look at as well. There's one of the books on the table over here to peruse. And then, of course, again, books for purchase today. And again, all of the sales go to the museums. So please support the museums. And thank you all so much for coming and having me and John here today. Thank you, Chris. Thank you all for thank being you. here. Um, remember about the events that we have coming up. We've got a schedule over there that you can pick up. Um, as we said, we've got copies of both books over here. They are fantastic if you haven't gotten to take a look at them. And I'm really excited about getting to see this pottery. Come back next week when Wesley Shoup will be here um, with his book on Mississippi's natural heritage. It's fantastic and gorgeous as well. One more time, help me thank John Ramsey Miller, Stephen Smith, for this program. Thank you. Oh. What's that? Oh, this thing. Oh, yeah. You don't have to worry about that. All right. Yeah, it did. It did. It sounded great. We had a ton of folks watching the live stream. Well, I, well now, I knew it as the... Oh, yes. I was this. When he was the director of the Delta State Art Department. That's where he was. years. Okay. And of course, he was there for probably years. Okay, that's where he was. He sure did.